Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, start off by thanking the organizers. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Albrecht. Thank you, Jackie. It's really an honor to be here. I do have to say that when I saw the list of everyone who was going to be here, I was getting somewhat intimidated. I felt a little bit like a first year uni student asked to go and give my term paper at the Institute for Advanced Study or something like that. <laughs> but it's a real honor, a pleasure to be here. And there's been a lot of excellent papers and discussions. Um, uh, je dirais aussi que car on est au Canada, je suis heureux de discuter en français. Si vous voulez, vous pouvez me dire après. On peut faire ça. Um, thank you also, uh, like Debbie said at the beginning, to the members of the Extinction Studies Working Group. I think Mick, Matt, Debbie, and I are here. Uh, but I also feel like in the last couple of days, the boundaries of the Extinction Studies Working Group have expanded um, because there's a lot of like-minded people here. So thank you for that. I'd like to take the science and humanities dialogue or science and humanities interface as seriously as possible here, uh, although it'll be somewhat of a short talk, a little bit synoptic. Um, and I'd like to take that interface between the science and the humanities seriously in terms of the objects and the methods and the concepts. And I also think I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and split the difference between the allotted times of the humanities presenters and the science presenters. When I saw the announcement that the humanities people would get a lot more time than the science presenters, I thought, there's something, something wrong with that. I mean, I know it has to do with disciplinary um, um, regularities uh, and practices, but um, I'll, I'll hit somewhere in the middle, I think. I won't take the entire humanities allotted time. Um, <laughs> All right, and also I apologize for not having any PowerPoint presentation. I didn't put one together for this, but I've tried to make up for it in a couple ways. The first is by clothing. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I'll show you, I'll show you an image from my t-shirt in, in a moment that has to do with the, with the, with the, uh, with the issue at hand. Um, and the other way is to take a, a note from Ben's talk yesterday, the intuition driver that you had in the image of the clown. I'll try to present in as clown-like a manner as possible. <laughs> All right, um, so I've already mentioned interfaces, and a lot of this will be about interfaces. It's a concept that, that comes up a lot. Um, you already saw Matt refer to Dominique Listel's use of the interface. It's an important concept in Deborah Bird Rose's work. Um, in, among other places, an article called um, Multi-Species Knots of Ethical Time that's in environmental philosophy. And it's also a concept that's drawn on heavily by an Italian cognitive ethologist named Roberto Marcassini, with whom I work. And I will talk more about Deborah and Roberto's work at the end. But first of all, a question that many of you might have asked. I asked myself this question many times um, in looking at the abstract. Um, why the Philidae, or why consider the examples that are listed in the abstract together. Um, what does it matter that, it, that they're from the same family? You know, after all, what do Lil Bub, the famous internet cat, in case you know her, and a tiger, let's say, in the Sundarbans, what do they have in common? There can be certain genetic and certain behavioral similarities, but what does it matter, really, that, they, that they're related in that way? Because there's a tremendous amount of difference. To refer back to Ted's talk, there's probably more difference than similarity there. And the, the answer is, because I'm interested in looking at interfaces, and uh, the three kind of examples I'll look at that are cited in the abstract are three different types of interfaces between humans and cats that allow us to look at death and um, interaction in different ways. Not all of them are formally about extinction, but all of them do have to do with death. Um, death caused by humans, or in some cases, death caused by animals. Maybe animals also acting in concert with humans. And the other part of the answer to that question is I study cats. It's the part of the Avenue B Multi-Study Center. The main part, probably, is the Center for Feline Studies. And it's quite possible that I have a uh, very bad case of toxoplasmosis, as many of my friends would probably attest by my <laughs> relationship to cats. <laughs> so the Philidae and the interface. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about an interface that's already been referred to. I think Matt referred to it. And um, even though I'm going to look at these interfaces, the real thrust of this paper, the direction of this paper, is a paper on ethics. And the last part, the longest part of the paper, is going to be about ethics. So the first section is going to be about 
um, extinction pressure on the big cats. Second part is going to be what about what I call zoicide, which is basically the extermination, the euthanization of millions or billions of animals every year because they don't fit into the confines of human populations. And the third part is going to be about these recent studies or headlines about um, domestic cats killing especially a lot of birds, but also small mammals, and looking a little more carefully at that. So we'll go through the three of those, and then the fourth part is about ethics. So the fourth part is to try to think about some of the ethical issues that come up in those other examples. Now, I wanted to start off by drawing on a really important interface that I was made aware of um, by two neuroscientists from Australia, um, Gisela Kaplan and Leslie Rogers, who have done really um, important work on birds. Um, I think Leslie Rogers, that's her name, right? Leslie Rogers, I want to make sure I got it right. Yeah. Um, really important work on brain lateralization in birds. I think, in fact, Leslie was the one who conclusively demonstrated that there is brain lateralization in birds. And they uh, pointed out at a conference on ethology that um, ethics and ethology are in some sense the same discipline. They both go back to the Greek term ethos, which has to do with like being used to, being, to doing something, being accustomed to doing something, to behavior, that kind of thing. So Gisela especially made a strong case that ethics and ethology are really the same domain of study. They both have to room. One might be more descriptive, one might be normative. But I think there's many types of crossovers between them. So that's an interface that I'd like to talk about. And a little bit about the background uh, of the Center for Feline Studies, which bears on that interface is that we're interested in feline interactions and feline-human interactions, especially social interactions. Um, and uh, as you saw, my training is um, in other fields. Um, I can't really say necessarily that I have a disciplinary home because I kind of constantly traverse back and forth between different ones. But um, basically, this is a social inquiry into the types of interactions that take place between felines and between felines and, and humans. We cooperate and collaborate in this research with a number of ethologists. For instance, Patrick Bateson, Dennis Turner, and Mark Beckoff. Um, and because their, their ethology, you know, as you know, probably Bateson and Turner are kind of uh, very prominent cat feline ethologists. So it really helps us to, get, to give us a lot of behavioral cues in terms of studying what the cats are doing, types of behavior that the cats are engaged in. Um, but there's also something interesting going on, and I think it's very relevant to this conference. This is partly takes place in the Center for Feline Studies, but partly it's something that's going on in a larger sense out there in the world, which is this. I think now the dust has basically settled in ethology, and it's accepted that there's animal culture, um, at least among a number of types of animals. For a while, that was a debate that was going back and forth. So the following has happened. A number of ethologists now realize that there's a tremendous accumulated store of methods and information from the social sciences, especially anthropology and sociology, in terms of studying culture. So there's starting to be a lot of really vibrant collaboration between ethologists and ethnographers in terms of looking at these questions of culture. Because um, there have been a lot of novel and very interesting ways of posing the issue of culture in biology, but there's a really productive methodological overlap there, and we're trying to fed into that. Let me mention briefly uh, four other figures, some of whom have come up already, um, and all of whom I think are very relevant to this conference. And I mention these four because these are four people who directly bridge the gap between the science and the humanities in their work, and they all work under the umbrella of what I usually refer to as ethoethnography, so this area in which we're trying to combine the methods of ethnography and ethology. And let me just say for a moment, if you take ethology and ethnography, both of them in their classical senses, the objects are different, humans versus animals, but the techniques are extremely similar. Meticulous, prolonged field work, taking notes, careful observation, similar type of thing. So these four figures are Dominique Lestel, who Matt already referred to, and Dominique is an ethologist at the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris, and he's also in the philosophy department at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. He's done field work, and he's also done this kind of philosophical exposition that Matt quoted some of, so there's an attempt already there to bridge, bridge the, the divide. Also, then there's Vincienne Desprez, who's from Liège in Belgium, and Brett is translating her 2012 book, Crédire les animaux, si on doit poser les bonnes questions. Um, and she uh, is a psychologist and a philosopher by training, and she described a lot of her work as um, the ethology of ethologists. And for instance, she spent a lot of time with the ethologist Emot Sahavi, um, uh, who studies birds and Arabian babblers, and she looked at the way in which um, there's a 
the way in which knowledge is produced through the interactions of the researchers and the birds in field settings, I guess is a way to put it. The third figure I'm um, drawing on here is Roberto Marcassini, who I mentioned already. He's a biologist and a cognitive ethologist, a cognitive scientist in Bologna, but he's also a philosopher. So he has a certain number of publications about cognitive science in animals, and he has some other publications that are more properly about philosophy, and then he has some where he brings them together. And he's the primary exponent of something that he calls zooanthropologia, zooanthropology, um, in Italy, and has a particular method along these lines. The fourth person is the great Italian ethologist Giorgio Celli. I don't know if anyone here knows him. He was the director of the Entomology Institute in Bologna for a long time, like 30 years. And, um, but he was also uh, an ethologist of felines. And he uh, was one of the first people to really seriously look at cats in ethological sense. And we can see this from uh, a few books of his. Um, he wrote a book called Il Gatto di Casa, Ethologia di Amicizia, so the house cat, an ethology of friendship. So already he's looking using ethological techniques to look at how house cats, but way ahead of his time, he saw friendship as an ethological category, which now I know that's like once again picked up, been picked up on. There's a lot more studies about friendship in, in ethology, field ethology, but he was kind of a, ahead of the curve on that. He also wrote a book called Etologia della Camera, so ethology of the bedroom or ethology of the household. So he wanted to look at complex interactions between humans and animals in human built environments of different kinds. And just briefly to um, judge two different books by their covers, which we might say is one of the pillars of the humanities. <laughs> um, he wrote a great book too called La Vita Segreta dei Gatti, The Secret Life of Cats. And the image on the front of that book is the same as the image on the front of your book, Eileen, about images of animals, that wonderful um, cat, cat image. Um, all right, so last point or the take home from this section is that because the empirical objects of study demand a methodological or a disciplinary crossover in this area, it, it's happening. It's not always necessarily, you know, 100% worked out or um, smooth, but at least it's um, something that's underway. All right, so briefly now to talk about three different examples of these type of interfaces between cats and humans. I forgot to show you my t-shirt, so I'll do that now. <laughs> um, can everyone see trim? Okay. Um, I want to say thank you to Tom Van Doren, who would have been here if he weren't presenting a paper in Australia, and Emily O'Gorman, they gave me this shirt. And if you've been to the State Library in New South Wales, you might know Trim. This is the image of a statue of Trim that's on the side of the State Library in New South Wales. And Trim is a fantastic cat and is a strong example of interface because he's the first cat to circumnavigate Australia. Um, he also... <laughs> He also circumnavigated the world, but I think for whatever reason he's better known for circumnavigating Australia. And the reason he did that was that he was the companion of a um, British uh, explorer named Matthew Flinders, and it means that he's an interface because he was intimately caught up in the project of British Empire and British expansion, and we, of course we all know that the introduction of cats into Australia had certain consequences, many of which they're overblamed for, but many of which are real, or the introduction of cats to, to New Zealand. Um, so anyway, Trim is an example of this kind of interface, uh, human-animal interface, and kind of illustrates what I'm looking at, what I'm talking about here. All right, about the big cats. In the abstract, or in the title, I've identified the big cats as the, the victims of, of extinction, um, which isn't too much of a stretch. Um, as everyone knows well, and I'm sure there's many people in this room who know even better than I do, the big cats are subject to many, of, many types of pressures such as habitat loss, um, extreme hunting, trophy collection, use in traditional Chinese medicine, grinding up tiger bones and that kind of thing, um, hunting to the point of eradication or extirpation within certain countries. I'll talk more about that in just a second. And of course, poaching, um, and as I said, use in, in med medical and folklore uses. As well, they're also subject to the loss of prey and to genetic depletion that threatens many populations. There's too many types of big cats to talk about here in detail, so I'll just talk about a few different examples. Um, one is the Florida panther, which um, is threatened with extinction, you know, may or may not be um, making some degree of, of um, I don't know if I would say rebound, but at least slight numerical increase in population, although there's debate about that. And um, the Florida panther shows this kind of interface because 
referring to what you were just talking about, Eileen, there's obviously extreme infrastructure development in Florida, which divides up and encroaches on the habitat of the panthers. And since they're, I mean, I suppose all cats are nomadic, but uh, or in some, or at least move around a range, but the panthers are, are, are especially so. And so the development of infrastructure in Florida has really impacted them. But also, um, they've started to be strongly affected by um, FIV and uh, feline leukemia, for instance, which um, some think originated from domestic cat populations, and now they're infected by those. Also, the other example I want to talk about is the Iberian lynx, which also seems to be um, threatened primarily, well, due to habitat encroachment, once again, because of infrastructure development and building in Spain, and also because of prey loss, which also probably pertains to overdevelopment and infrastructure extension. And but now there's some discussion that there could be a possible relocation of the lynxes to the south of France and to the vineyards, which might prove to be an amenable ecosystem for them to live in. That may fall victim to some of the kind of um, concerns that we've heard about already, whether you can just pick someone up and transplant them somewhere else and they'll take to that or not. But they're an example of this type of interface. I was speaking about hunting to the level of extirpation or, or um, removal of certain types of animals in certain places. Um, and uh, an example of this um, that we see um, in India, for instance, which is kind of a hot spot in this regard because it's a major uh, area in which tigers live, and also because I'm going to speak at the end of the paper about some aspects of um, Hinduism and Hindu ethics that might pertain to and actually surprisingly cross over with scientific approaches. Um, we see already uh, a massive change in certain stories. If you look at certain accounts, um, both ancient accounts, but also accounts that go back like 100 or 150 years, you already see a tangible change um, in what's recounted in those stories versus in what you would see in, in India today. And some examples of that are, of course, the Asian lion, which had been quite um, um, numerous in India, and you see it referred to in many stories going way back, and it was hunted to um, extirpation in India, so you clearly don't see any Asian lion anymore in India. And another example of that is the cheetah. You know, kids growing up nowadays, even my generation, would think that never, think the cheetah never lived, the lion never lived in India, but that's not the case. Both of them did, and they figure in different kind of stories going back some length of time. So. Big cats, fairly enough, are figured as the victim, I think, in our discourse about extinction in terms of this inter interface or interchange. Um, because it's primarily due to human hunting, inappropriate, or I would say inappropriate uses of animals for medicine or for, um, for, for other types of applications, and especially um, habitat encroachment and infrastructure development, as well as, of course, just the kind of thing that Debbie was talking about at the beginning, being labeled as a pest and the mobilization of a kind of hatred and a kind of um, um, drive to extirpation um, um, or, or thrill killing, I guess, and that kind of hunting of just like how many, how many tiger heads can you get and how many um, tiger hides can, can you get and sell. So big cats are the victims in a certain sense in this respect, or at least um, figuratively. Um, second example is that which I call zoicide or theriocide, and that's the motivation to control animal populations which relies on a determination of the amenability or the acceptability of those animal populations to human ones. Um, and again, I'm thinking here a, a bit of the article that Deborah Bird Rose and Tom Van Doren wrote about uh, multi-species cities. Um, and where there's a discussion about transspecies urbanism in Sydney, and it especially focuses on flying foxes and on penguins, little penguins. But there's a discussion about the phenomenon of um, transspecies urbanism or the ability of different kind of species to fit into the kind of human built environment. I think James mentioned this before. Yesterday you said that dogs and cats are usually much more suited to fitting into this kind of human built environment, whereas other species um, don't have much more difficulty to do that. Although sometimes I think we're surprised about the kind of species that, that can. Just last week I was walking through Tompkins Square Park in the East Village, which you may know, and I was surprised because they were about 15 feet away sitting on a fence. There was a, one of the red-tailed hawks that lives in the park sitting on the rail of the fence, just having caught a rat, which you can see from time to time. Um, um, all right. So 
this comes as no surprise, and we've already heard many times during this conference, that some, some animals are more welcome or adapted than others to living in cities and to living with humans. Um, and I think that um, when we start to talk about the practice of euthanizing animals, you know, domestic animals, or sometimes they're feral, or sometimes they're kind of like in some indeterminate category, even wild, um, there's a determination that our human society, our human built environment doesn't have the space for certain types of animals or there's an op optimum population level. So therefore there's an affirmative duty to do away with a number of animals, a number of individuals to control that kind of balance. And it may be the case at some level that um, that, that is the case. Um, certainly there are, um, you know, public health problems could, could arise in, in extreme cases of overpopulation of different kinds of um, urban wildlife. Um, but for the most part, I think that this uh, fits into um, a couple troubling categories. One is the category that Debbie described at the beginning that I already made referred to, already made reference to. And the other one is a kind of um, rationalization um, and a kind of uh, killing made invisible that Eileen just made reference to in terms of factory farming. Um, uh, and also I think that we see illustrated in certain kinds of 20th century critical theory like Horkheimer and Adorno. And in this respect, I refer back to what Graham uh, Gibson was saying on the panel yesterday when he said he thought there were no major advances in um, thought, political contestatory thought in the 20th century. The last big ones were Marx. And I guess in a way you could say that Horkheimer and Adorno are going back to Marx. But I think that their understanding of this kind of rationalization of killing <coughs> kind of justification and rationalization of killing and also the ability to cast it as invisible so that it's somehow walled off from the general public dialogue. I think that that's an advancement that also applies very strongly to the treatment of a lot of animals and certainly in factory farming. There's also the issue of cats as food. Um, not as common here, but in many parts of the world, um, cats are treated in a manner that's parallel to the pigs that we saw in your slide or the cows and other, other livestock. And we oftentimes might just think that that happens, for instance, in China or in Asia, but that's not entirely the case. It's also a practice that has been strong and continues in some places in Italy. Giorgio Celli makes reference to that, that uh, people would, would hunt cats and even to a kind of bizarre um, yearly cat killing, killing and eating festival um, that goes back probably at least to the Middle Ages. Okay. So has to do with the euthanization or elimination of excess animal populations and the construal of who's acceptable. And it legitimizes all kinds of means, like the capture and control and killing. Much of it is kind of made, um, um, is, is sanitized, I guess, in the respect that it's supposed to take place uh, through lethal injection, through the kind of euthanization you would have at the vet. But also, in other cases, you have the kind of practices that Deb referred to about people taking it upon themselves to uh, uh, go out and beat and kill cats or, or poison cats and that kind of thing. But I just wanted to point, point to this because I think the fact that so many animals, not only cats but dogs and others, or you know, alligators, other kind of animals that don't fit within the human built environment or human society, at least in terms of our construal of it, are subject to this kind of treatment every year. Not only are they treat, are they subject to it, but I think the fact that they're subject to it has a kind of ethical blowback on us. Uh, even if it's made invisible, I think that there's a kind of an ongoing ethical issue, which on the one hand is an issue of right or wrong, but on the other hand, it's an issue of how it affects us in terms of our knowledge or our complicity of being part of a system and that does that. All right, the third section, the third example, has to do with these recent well, recent, but actually also old, going way back uh, reports that cats kill, well, in the recent stories, it's that cats kill billions of, of birds, especially, and small mammals. And let me say at the outlet that um, even though um, I'm interested in cats, I'm not one of the people, like I think Roger Tabor has kind of taken this line and others, that somehow it's necessary, Jessica and I were talking about this the other day, that there's this, some people take this line that it's somehow necessary to the species being of the cat, I guess, if you will, that it must roam free and it must hunt. So if you keep domestic cats, that it's almost like an affirmative obligation that you have to let them go outside and you have to let them do what they want. I don't believe that. I mean, for one thing, in New York City, it's totally impractical <laughs> because they're going to get run over or some, something else bad's going to happen to them. But uh, I don't believe that a good case can be made that they must be allowed to go outside and roam. I think it's much more, I mean, not only they're more vulnerable to diseases that are likely to shorten their lifespan, but it clearly has an impact on local wildlife populations. That being said, I think there's a number of 
and even though I fully acknowledge that it's true that cats do prey on birds and do prey on other small animals, I think there's some problems or at least some issues we want to look at in some of those recent stories. For one thing, they're very sensational, right? And I think in the abstract I mentioned the headlines, not the stories or even the studies per se, because oftentimes it was just the headlines that circulated. And partly that's a phenomenon of our modern culture and Twitter and everything, but oftentimes it was just the cats kill billions that you saw spread spread around. And then sometimes some people might go to the news stories and then even more rarely they might actually go to look at the, store, the studies themselves. There's a couple major cl classes of studies here we're talking about, mostly the recent ones from University of Georgia um, and then also other ones from the um, middle central, central England. And those studies happen also to make use of the cat cams, which you've probably seen, the kind of necklaces or collars they put to, uh, to affix um, cameras to the cats. And um, those are very interesting as a phenomenological tool because on one level they do offer us a cat's eye view or at least that's often the claim. You know, we're seeing what the cat sees. They're pointing in the direction of the cat's movement and we see what the cat sees. But there's immediately some issues or problems with that. One, we don't precisely see what the cat sees, right? Because our visual um, and sensory apparatus is different than the feline uh, visual and sensory apparatus. So we're seeing something different. We're maybe getting down to their level and there's a value to that of seeing that field of vision, but we're not precisely capturing exactly what they see, exactly what they're, what they're doing. There's another significant issue, which is that those appendages, those technical appendages, in, in turn affect the behavior of the cats and the maneuverability of the cats. They're made to be as low profile as possible, but there's still an issue about the way in which they modify the behavior of the cats. And I don't think we can really be certain that um, even if they, quote, get used to them, that they are just behaving in precisely the same way that they would otherwise. And there's kind of an analog to this because I also think that you know, good ethologists these days no longer believe in the old myth of habituation, right? So chimpanzees, for instance, might get used to your being around, but they never are going to act in a way, well, they're always, let me put it this way, they're always conscious of a human being there. And the fact that a human is there kind of initiates or opens up a different kind of social space. Very interesting things can be seen, but it's a slightly different problem than just what, is, uh, what the chimpanzees would be doing in and of themselves without any kind of outside presence. I think there's still an even more interesting problem there, which is this kind of etho um, ethnographic problem, which is what happens when these kind of social environments happen. And I think we do have to call them social environments. I don't mean, I mean, I know that some ethologists do interact with the chimpanzees, but um, in a, you know, even a tactile way. But even if they're not doing that, even if there's a distance, a separation, there's still a type of social environment that's been constituted there. All right, so the cat cams are a phenomenological tool, but there's some, some issues with that. All right. They do allow us to see the cats killing certain type of animals, um, birds, you know, mice, moles, that kind of thing. However, there's some serious issues of extrapolation because we're taking kind of minuscule um, samples or you know, good, good samples, good statistics, but still carried out in a particular area. And then there's an attempt to extrapolate those samples to either national or international levels. And there's some problems with that. One of the main problems with that is we have very poor numbers on the number of domestic cats let alone feral cats that are out there. So it makes it very difficult to make an accurate extrapolation. So the billions figure uh, is subject maybe to some of the um, uh, statistical mystery that Tom was re referring to the other day that can, that can crop up. Um, okay. Also, there's an issue, I kind of referred to this about the cat cams, but there's an issue, there's a way in which the technology drives the inquiry in a sense. The cat cams became available, they became, you know, the, the size uh, and the uh, ability to insert batteries that lasted longer and longer and disk drives that lasted longer and longer made it possible to have this technology and therefore it kind of drove the experiment or drove the observations. I think that's fine and it's good to take advantage of technology like that, but that's another dimension of this problem or this area I'd like to look at. Okay, the last issue I'd like to highlight briefly about this is that there's an associated issue when the cats are blamed for, for killing birds. There's an associated issue of human versus feline responsibility. So in other words, the way the stories or the headlines are often couched, it's as if the cats, out of their own bloodthirsty free will, set about to go out and extirpate all these bird populations. And 
yes, they kill birds, but of course they're kind of, um, they're, they're cohabitants with us, right? Domestic cats are cohabitants with us. So humans play a role in bringing them into those environments. Humans certainly play a role in deciding whether or not they're gonna let their cats roam uh, in a way that they can kill, kill birds, for instance. And so I think sometimes the cats get a bad rap, and this has happened a lot in Australia too, um, so that um, the human baseline of habitat encroachment or pollution or other factors is left aside, and then it's then the, the cat's impact alone is highlighted. So we kind of, in, you know, we talk about how important it is to extend agency to animals, and I think that is important in terms of this kind of interactive approach. But in this sense, we're extending too much agency to the cats because we're letting them take the blame for a lot of the things that, that humans do, and I think that um, that's that's the problem. Lastly, I said I made reference to the fact that this is an old debate. Um, you, the one kind of the godfather of um, Feline ethology is Paul Lehausen, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, he studied um, oh, this cat behavior, human behavior in 1956. And even there, he is already making reference to debates about how, the degree to which cats kill bird populations or small mammal populations, but especially he was already focused on the bird issue because there was already a concern in Germany at that time that house cats were killing too many birds. And he looks at a number of um, stomach content studies, and I'll just stop for a moment to say that we could probably shudder a little bit to think about the methods involved in those, in those studies, but um, he looks at a number of stomach content studies going back to the 20s, and he shows that in fact, based on those, there's a relatively small proportion of bird predation compared to other kinds of predation. That doesn't mean that it's good or bad, but for some reason, I think people probably are more willing to accept cats killing mice than they are birds, especially because there's this ancient kind of association that we have with cats based on their killing um, rats and mice or rodents who might otherwise eat our, our food supply. So anyway, just to signal that the headlines are new, but it's really an old debate that's been going on a long time. All right, the last section on ethics um, it has to do, I was just talking about an ethics of coevolution and cohabitation. If it's the case that for 10,000 years or more, felines uh, have lived with humans and we've actively relied on them for a lot of that time to protect our survival by guarding our food, then there's an ethical issue about quickly turning around and blaming them for these kinds of predation that I'm, that I'm talking about. Or at least we would have to keep in mind the background of that kind of coevolution and cohabitation. Um, and I also I referred to the issue of human versus, versus feline um, responsibility. Um, uh, um, you know, it's easier to blame the cats than maybe to think seriously and say, I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna keep my cat inside, I'm gonna play with my cat. All right, a third issue that I wanna make reference to is an issue that I call, um, yeah, some, you know, I, I heard someone talk about this recently, actually it was a vet saying that the notion of playing with your dog is extremely well ingrained and everyone understands that, but the notion of playing with your cat isn't, isn't as ingrained. People just think, oh, they, they take care of themselves and they do what they want, but that's not really true, right? They respond to stimulation, they respond to playing. Last issue is an issue I said I was gonna talk about, um, Hindu ethics, is an issue that I put under the heading of what I say, different dharma or different duties and different life ways and death ways. Um, I'll expand on this more, but I just want to say that this is a, one way in which we can expand or add on to the ethical debate or draw in different issues. Um, I think that ethics is crucial, obviously, to our discussions about these areas, but the ethical debate has oftentimes become really sterile. It's kind of run up on the grounds of uh, consequentialism and deontology. So like um, for non-philosophers, deontology is Kant, like something is like right or wrong in and of itself, doesn't matter what the consequences are. In utilitarianism, uh, consequentialism is more like mill, greatest good for the greatest number. We should do whatever benefits the greatest number of people. Both of those approaches are important, but just because of the disciplinary way in which those those have been um, sedimented within uh, the um, Anglo Anglophone world. Um, those have become the big players in the game. And more than that, certain very well-worn lines of understanding animal ethics have emerged from both of those camps. So it can make it very difficult to redress these questions. A few weeks ago, I went to a panel at NYU um, about, it was specifically devoted to animal ethics and some of the big guns were there. Peter Singer was sitting right next to me and folks like that. And uh, one of the funny things about this panel was pretty much everyone agreed at the end that it succeeded in not really being about animals at all. <laughs> it ended up being this kind of like, 
hypothetical debates about you know, hypothetical philosophical situations that could be construed. But at the end, everyone was saying, well, wait, what we're supposed to be talking about animals here. And they, they dropped out of the picture. So that's the danger. I'd like to put the animals back in, so to speak. There are several ways in which this can happen. We already have, for instance, and this is one of the reasons I'm drawing on Deborah's work, I, the, the work of Emmanuel Levinas. And for non-philosophers, let me just describe briefly and say that Levinas was a French philosopher who, in addition to being basically single-handedly or at least majorly responsible for introducing the work of Martin Heidegger into France, he also had a very particular ambiguous um, role because he's, a, uh, uh, he's Jewish, living in France. At the beginning of World War II, he joined the French army. He was ra rapidly captured and he was in a prisoner of war camp in Germany for the rest of the war. During that time, much of his family was exterminated in the concentration camps. He went on to develop a very eloquent and very moving account of ethics based on the face, based on the claim that the face makes. Um, and it was partly, or perhaps it seems like entirely based on his experience in the camp because he said that the only person or the only agent who redeemed his humanity, the humanity of the other inmates of the camp, was this dog named Bobby. So he said none of the German guards, none of the German civilians, not even his fellow inmates, none of them redeemed each other's humanity. They were all totally dehumanized. The only person that redeemed them, in a sense, was this dog Bobby who would show up when they were going out to work and when they were coming back at night. And he said that the claim of this, you know, Bobby looking at them, Bobby recognizing them, was an ethical claim. That being said, the only major problem is that when he developed this ethical um, account based on faciality, he went on to say that animals don't have a face and can't make this kind of claim on us. Um, so Levinas sits in this kind of funny position here where it's like perfectly suited on the one hand to talk about animal ethics, but on the other hand, he specifically foreclosed that possibility by saying that animals don't have that kind of face. But I think even on biological grounds, we can kind of disprove him because he gives all these kind of criteria for what a face is, like a forehead, a nose, a chin. Many animals have those things, right? So if you even go through his, his checklist, I think that we can say that on his, his, on his grounds, he, he was wrong, you know, and we can kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. But there's that problem, there's that schism there. There's a further problem, which is that even though there's a lot of discussion about Levinas, he's still um, highly marginalized. He's highly marginalized within, certainly within Anglophone philosophy, um, even to a certain extent within French philosophy. Um, and so those ideas haven't gained the kind of traction that might be really helpful in a wider, wider discourse. And I want to point very briefly to another tradition or set of traditions that I think also can do that. Um, which is just to just for a moment speak generally to say uh, Eastern traditions. So for instance, like Hinduism, and I'll pick up on something Margaret Atwood was talking about yesterday in terms of Hinduism as a religion that has a reverence for animals. And let me say briefly too that Hinduism we ordinarily think of as a religion, but many Hindus would also likely think of it as a thought system that also includes science, including mathematics and astronomy <coughs> and certain forms of, of biology. Then there's, of course, Buddhism, I think Eileen was referring to the other day, and Jainism. In a certain way, we can identify those as part of the Hindu panoply. In another way, they, along with yoga, play this counter tradition in the history of Hinduism that made Hinduism come to advocate vegetarianism. Hinduism, like many other religions, was originally based on animal sacrifice, and it was those counter movements that kind of raised that as an issue and started to make, make um, vegetarianism an issue, or also Shinto in Japan. And let me just say, I don't want to think of these as like just the same thing, because that would be analytically sloppy and the worst kind of Orientalism. But I think that there's a lot of resources there that we could stand to draw on. And once again, there's kind of a disciplinary problem, because um, you know there's already a problem to draw in Levinas, but in the Ang Anglophone philosophical world, it's not impossible, but, but it's very, very difficult to do what we call comparative philosophy and draw in non-Western traditions. It gets really to religion, and we think that it's uh, you know therefore somehow like um, um, you know mushy or, or um, uh, you know metaphysical or something like that. But I think there's real um, strong um, uh, ethical resources there. Let me tell you a vignette. Um, this comes from my main teacher about Hindu ethics, who's a, a, a she's a biologist and a physician, but also uh, um, a strict vegetarian. Her name's uh, Shapna Mukherjee. Uh, she's a strict vegetarian, does no meat in her house, won't cook meat, takes great pains to remove spiders and even roaches from her house and bring them outside rather than kill them, won't use any kind of chemical um, uh, pesticides in her house. Um, so that shows you an extension of her type of ethical commitment. However, a few years ago when I went to visit her um, and two of my cats came with me, um, 
one of the first things she said, she was delighted that the cats were there, and one of the first things she said is, I'm going to go to the pet store and get some live mice to bring to the cats, to the house. And on the first, on the first, first glance, you might think, that's really crazy, right? That, that you know, it's an abrogation of her principles. Um, it's, you know, seems, seems somehow like unsettling, but it actually makes sense in the respect of this idea of the different dharmas, which is basically that different types of creatures have different types of duties or different type of ethical orientations. Um, let me, I'll read, read you a brief, I'm almost finished, but I'll read you a brief quote from Wendy Doniger, who's a, a, um, a Sanskritist from the University of Chicago, who illustrates this idea. She said, we, we have noted the preeminence of dharma among the three aims, both in its status and in the number of texts devoted to it. Dharma is complex, in part because it is a site of contestation between, between renunciation and violence. At the same time, however, each individual was supposed to follow a unique path laid out for them at birth a path determined primarily by the class into which they were born. This was their own particular dharma, svadharma. A person's svadharma was sometimes called their innate activity. The circularity of karma is explicitly set from the time of creation. You must be what you are. You cannot change your qualities. The recreation of individual characteristics in, is inevitable, likened to the natural processes of the seasons. The innate characteristics also include what we might regard as individual nature, for which there is another term in Sanskrit, svabhava. This, thus it is that the innate particular nature, svabhava, of a tiger is to be cruel and of a dove to be gentle, just as it, is, as it is the karma of the tiger to kill and eat smaller animals and of a dove to coo. This too is svadharma, which is built into you, leaving you very few choices in many realms of action. So let me just say by way of closing that I think there's something important to this idea about understanding the different kind of expected behaviors or innate activity, as she calls it, of different types of animals. So to put it simply, um, then the innate activity of, of cats is to kill, right? Which is part of why you can make this claim that it's good to keep them inside. But also that we would have to factor that in in ethical consideration if we're talking about the number of birds or number of animals that cats kill because the spa dharma of the cats is different than the svadharma of the birds. Let me say lastly that I think, I said that um, Hinduism is not just a religion, but also many people would see it as a science. And I think there's a really interesting crossover here, which is um, that even from within the like, biological grounds, you could arrive at precisely the same conclusion. Many people refer to the fact that cats and other uh, animals are obligate carnivores, and so they must eat meat. So it's wrong to try to make your cat be vegetarian, for instance. And I think that notion, that um, understanding of evolution and development, that the cat is an obligate car carnivore, is parallel, or is maybe even identical with this idea of svadharma, a different type of innate activity. Um, um, and um, one more thing about that that I was going to close with. Can't remember. Um, Svadharma, innate activity. Anyway, it just seems to illustrate a crossover <laughs> that we can arrive, maybe it's a transverse relation, that we can arrive to the same type of realization, the same kind of ethical realization versus what we may, might call a religious route or versus what we might call a, oh yeah, I remember what the closing is, or what, versus what we might call a biological route. And I going to say that I think this is borne out because there's a number of people like many of you know Gary Steiner for instance who makes a strong claim strong philosophical claim that humans must be vegan um, on ethical grounds however he lives with cats who he rescued and he feeds those cats meat and I think he has this understanding of, obligate, of being an obligate car carnivore of, or of svadharma so I think we already have this kind of ethical principle kind of built into a lot of our understanding thank you very much TNR program, trap, neuter, release program, based on the evidence elsewhere that's reduced the suffering of uh, straight urban cats and so forth. Um, and um, and I've been uh, and I've been asked to contribute to that. And of course, I've been pushing the collaborative decision analysis and adaptive management model because there are different points of view about what the cause of the predicament is and who's to blame and everything else, which in our world constitute testable hypotheses. And so we've been sort of moving in that direction and, and getting the cat cams lined up and also the 
the uh, um, uh, analysis, the barcoding analysis of the contents of the guts to line up with the cameras and the guts and check the, the kinds of uh, critical assumptions that you're talking about about what these things actually tell us okay. in terms of the animal behavior and everything. But um, yeah, so I, I so we're we're trying to deal with this with this whole issue in a real robust sort of way, but get all the stakeholders involved because I mean the bird people are are, are just aghast when I say, well you know you guys might be to blame. And they go, what do you mean we're to blame? I said, well you put out all these fears. I mean you you know, optimal foraging principles tell you that if you build it, they will come. <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to build in a multi-factor kind of design where everybody's going to have to give a little, hopefully to learn a lot and resolve the critical uncertainties among us to the benefits of the birds, <coughs> the humans, and the cats all at the same time. And, and I'm just thinking, man, I would like you in that group somehow. I would like, because you seem just eminently reasonable about <laughs> <laughs> Evidence and you know the balance between reason and passion that we all struggle with and everything. Uh, yeah, wow. Well, thank you. I'd be, I feel like a judge. I'd be glad to start. Be glad to cooperate with you. <laughs> Keep going, man. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions. Oh, uh, Ursula. Yeah, I was, I was going to sort of pick you up a little bit on that on the cat and songbird problem. We have a huge cat problem in, in LA. Okay. There's two, three million feral cats in the in the city, um, and um, and a lot of cats are being let run free. And there's been um, huge confrontations over this where the environmental set levies, you know, the feral cat, and there, it's not just the songbirds; they're also causing tremendous amounts of fur. And some people complain that they bring fleas into houses with air and pets. So it's, it's been an ongoing conflict, and it's it has an obvious pitted um, certain homeowners and then environmentalists against animal welfare advocates in really, I mean, interesting ways. And it is about the fact that that the um, that the, the cat owners sort of, and the, the, so so the cat advocates do a little bit what you do, a little bit of hand waving, saying, yeah, the cats are a problem, but so is pollution, so are other things. I don't think that makes a problem go away. I mean, I think we do know that the cats are a problem. I mean, to address it along with you know the various other things that also impact songbird populations, and so so the conflict has been over the cat advocates saying you know we agree to um, capture, spam, and release, but nothing else essentially you know, and of course you know a certain number have been put in sanctuaries, but um, once it gets to the hundreds of thousands or even millions of feral cats, um, you know you can't really do that. And I'm just kind of wondering. I, th this is really where it's hard to know what the solution is that's good for the cats and good for the birds and good for the people. And I find myself of two minds about it because I totally see the animal welfare argument, but I also do see that that um, you know, the songbird uh, diversity is is you know a minute is a fraction of what it could be um, given the dense vegetation around many many parts of LA. We should have a lot more. Time. Okay. Yeah. Um, I get what you're saying and I agree with you. And I think it's interesting just from a kind of academic or SDS point of view, it's interesting the kind of fault lines that come up around these type of issues and sometimes they're predictable and sometimes it's not predictable who's taking up what side or what kind of weird bedfellows form around the issues. Um, I definitely support people keeping their cats inside. I support trap neuter release in an ideal world. I wish that uh, even more people were like me and had you know, kept more cats and, and therefore it would help to reduce the feral population. Um, uh, I agree with you. That's an intractable problem. I mean, that's a huge. I mean, there's also obviously a huge cross-cultural differences about the different countries. There's the way in which animal populations live is different. Like in Italy and India, both the cats tend to be much more free-running. They're kind of between feral and domestic because they're not entirely feral. They interact with people, but people feed them, and they're on the streets. But then they're out there and they're hunting whatever. You know, sometimes that's good because it's rats and stuff. Sometimes that's bad because it's birds. And um, anyway, I can't offer any. Other insight, I, I'm afraid, but uh, but um, I agree with you, and uh, I love birds too. I don't want to give them a bad rap. Or like, there's, a, there's, a, there's an awesome little segment that you know you don't to on so-called the mechanism um, PBS uh, radio show on that, that has the um, the yeah, 12-minute segment on that conflict, which is the most unbelievable types. Um, the Beverly Hills housewife, the crazy cat lady, the tweedy environmentalist. I mean, it's, it's like, and like I was a storybook, and they're all there. Wow, um, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. There are a few more questions, and we probably shouldn't go past five after. So, uh, Albert? Yeah, just early on when you were developing your argument, you were talking about um, humans killing 
animals, right? And, and you're speaking about uh, eradication of, you know, for example, of cats because of the. So it made me think about a project that I work on, which is what a, it's on like invasive species. So what what does what does someone like you, with your perspective, what do you think of of the eradication of invasive species? So I'm, especially species that. So I work on mink, okay? So mink farms exist uh, in Europe and South America. In particular, they, the mink escape from mink farms. And in Scotland and other places, there is now a bounty on, on American mink that, have, that you know, they've escaped, they're breeding, they're impacting uh, indigenous or native species. Um, and now people can get money, they, they can make money from killing these, these mink. So what, is, is there any, perspective that the you know, ethicist would bring to that kind of question? That's a difficult one, a really difficult one. And I have to say that probably my ecology is too limited to like fully um, be able to speak to all the ramifications in a given environment about the interaction of those kind of species with others. Um, um, in the, well, you can make an ethical case, certainly, if you see cases where uh, invasive species are directly predating or eliminating other native species and you see this kind of um, violence going on, I guess, you could probably make an, uh, articulate an ethical argument as to somehow controlling the invasive species by some means. Um, I do think, however, some, that gets to be a very complicated question. I mean, in some cases, it's clear what an invasive species is. You know, I grew up in New Mexico, salt cedar along the Rio Grande, that's clearly an invasive species. And so, you know, but um, uh, other cases, it gets much more difficult to determine. You know, typically, cats are treated as an invasive species in, in Australia, but then Debbie made me aware, and Stephen Muki, that in fact, um, Aboriginal writings or accounts make reference to cats going back an awful long time, thousands of years at least. Um, and then further, once the invasive species gain a certain foothold, so to speak, other people have talked about this too, the ecosystem is transformed. So then at what point, you know, who's native and who's, who's um, invasive, it gets to be a very difficult determination. I pointed to the example of cats in Australia because they certainly have done a lot of damage there, but there's also been an awful lot of instances where they were blamed for things and then it was found out later that it wasn't really them. Like for an example with the little penguins, they were saying the cats were predating the nests a lot um, and then they realized, I've learned this in the site down by, by, down by Melbourne in Victoria, then they realized it was actually primarily humans stepping on the ground and crushing the nests, but it would have been like easier somehow to say the cats did it, you know. Um, <laughs> So that's not really a good or neat answer, but I recognize well, that. I'll, I'll chat with you later. Isn't it even more what makes it more complicated is that mink escape from mink farms in the American mink's native range. Oh. So you've got a domesticated oh. version of mink that's escaping into like natural wild mink um, uh, habitat, and there's interbreeding going on. It's, it's a pretty interesting, and complicated story. Interesting. But there's, okay. an ethical, there's an ethical question yeah. around like the squirrels too, right? right? Yeah. 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 So, okay. Yeah. One, one last question. Yeah, I don't know if it's so much a question or an observation, and it it might be reflective of me not really knowing much about the philosophical debate. But um, but it, it seemed to me that uh, that all of this would be solved if we didn't have cats. <laughs> and, and, and it struck me that the, the similarities between your talk and the previous talks that uh, maybe having cats is a freedom that we all uh, expect, similar to resource res uh, extraction for, for consumption. Um, so anyway, that's part of it. And then the other part is that it struck me as well that um, having cats and keeping them in captivity in a very, or in, in captivity in in households in a very artificial environment is not all that dissimilar to keeping wild animals in zoos uh, and, and not allowing those ecological uh, processes like predation or, or hunting to occur. So, um, Excellent yeah. points. <laughs> um, uh, as far as the first one, um, it could well, I mean, in a certain sense, it is a kind of a luxury, right, to like, be, you know, cat food, you know, for animal food industry and that kind of thing. And many people like myself are a vegetarian, but nonetheless buy a lot of meat every week, uh, you know, it's paradox, paradox, you know, Shabna Mukherjee, I was lucky to point you to. Um, uh, but from an ethical point of view, I would say there's an issue, you know, I said you know, in a certain way, we owe our survival as a species at this point on this history of cohabitation with cats, right? They probably carried us through a lot of periods of grain storage by protecting us or protecting the grain, protecting the food from rodents or predators that would have eaten that food if we 
if we didn't. So we owe them, you could say, a certain kind of obligation that way. So I would think there's maybe like kind of a parallel ethical situation that you could say, okay, my grandparents live with me, and yes, they gave me life, but um, you know, they're not really doing anything anymore. All they're doing is like eating this food I have to get every week, so I might as well get rid of them, my grandparents, right? So, you know, so maybe there's something like that. And then that, I'm definitely sensitive to that issue about <laughs> keeping them inside and captivity. There's just a, cu a couple issues. I think that cats, I mean, cats are very malleable, and there's this issue about wild populations constantly like recrossing over with like feral or populations and that kind of thing. But in general, they're much more attuned to cohabitation with humans. And maybe sometimes it's in this kind of like quasi wild in the streets, like open fields, and then that kind of way. But they're much, much more accustomed to being able to adapt themselves to human environments, like James was saying. And so I don't. So and there's a lot of it, there's a lot of new work by Dominique Lestel and others about looking at those kind of territories and like the territory of an apartment and saying, we tend to treat this as a human-only space, but from the cat point of view, that's a cat-only space, right? Or it's a cat space, and they inhabit it and adapt to it in ways that are, that are unique, and we tend to kind of overlook those or kind of poo-poo those, but there's unique ways in which they take use of those spaces, and I don't think it's necessarily a deprivation or a incarceration or that kind of thing, although so I do worry about that. So, in the zoo, though, I guess it's something that, and it's not, I have cats, well, and I don't disagree, well, but, but I mean, pandas don't have a history of yeah, but hunting is, is still ingrained in them. Well, okay, anyway, it's a good discussion. We could have. Maybe we'll break it off. Yeah. Once again, let, let's thank Jeffrey.